Stand with me, please, and turn to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 3. Look at chapter 3 and 4 for a few moments. Paul, Paul speaking to the Corinthians, there certainly was a number of things that he addressed in the first epistle. A lot of different situations there. And even... Uh, we understand the importance of the glorious gospel being preached to people that are lost. But even for me not to forget about the glorious gospel years and years after I'm saved, how amazing the gospel is and the message is. And just to be constantly refreshed like we... Wasn't that an awesome message this morning? That was a message. Thank you, Pastor Shout. Thank you, God. Thank you. That was a great message. Wow, it was... I was thinking about the message so much, I didn't even... I said, what am I going to talk about? What am I going to preach about? I don't know. You know? And um, anyway, it was great. It was awesome. You could sense... I didn't think demons could get within two miles of this place this morning. I just think that with the, when, with the glorious gospel, they're out of here. They're not even like hanging around like the outskirts of the parking lot or around the corner. They're, they're done. They're, they're done. They really are. And... Uh, so, 2 Corinthians 3.14, but their minds were blinded. We see this mentioned twice. Mental blindness. And boy, isn't that a problem today, even in so-called Christianity, and we thank God people are saved. And Paul says if uh, they're preaching Christ, then even if it's out of envy and wrong motives, Christ is preached. But the truth remains that what is being preached is not the glorious gospel. And people get, people get saved because of the nature of God, you know? So it says, But their minds were blinded, for until the day, until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, the veil is done away in Christ. Then turn to chapter 4, and if you turn, it should be right there. Verse 3, it says, If our gospel, and I love that statement, whose gospel? You know, he says, it's my gospel in Romans 2.16. In other words, it's not, when I receive it, it becomes what? Mine. Mine. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Father, thank you, God, that you've lifted the blinders off of our eyes. We can see, like blind Bartimaeus, son of David, have mercy, and he did. And that we came blinded, sinners, enemies, ungodly, unrighteous, unclean, and you set us free. We thank you. Thank you for this gospel. What an awesome gospel. It's a glorious gospel. In Jesus' name, Amen. You may be seated. I was thinking about uh, two tribes who, the two particular tribes in a particular country, I won't mention which country or the names of the tribes, but they literally, there is a hatred one tribe for another. It's been going on for 120 years, and it's involved all kinds of atrocities and things. But you know what's great when we have a greater grace team in an African church where people from both tribes are on the same team, mission team, and there's like nothing there. Like here, you, got, you might have some Ravens fans, you might have some other people, and, and, and they just love each other. They just love each other. They're never going to let that get in the way. Isn't that awesome? They're never going to let that get in the way. It's just whatever. Okay? It's really amazing. It's like sometimes in Ghana, there's certain, that when the Pastor Lawson was here and when the Ghanaians beat the Americans, he was, yeah, 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 yeah. Then the Italians beat the Ghanaians and I said, I'm a citizen of both countries. <laughs> that was the end of his conversation for quite a while, but now he, he realizes that, wow. And, and this is because of this message of the gospel. When I went in 1986 to West Africa, in Ghana, 
I was uh, in the airport and then brought to a certain place to stay in a little lodge. I was there with Pastor Cooper, and uh, that was quite exciting. He's very interesting uh, when it comes to little bugs and stuff like that. Ooh. Yeah. He don't, doesn't like bugs. And, uh, and uh, they asked me to preach uh, in a place called Ashama, which is one of my favorite places in all of Ghana. And uh, that's where our conference is with Pastor Wright, myself, Pastor Ronaldo, Pastor Chuck. And I went, they said, what are you going to be preaching tonight? So I went there, and they had put some, some boards up. And they said, you just stand here and preach. And I'm thinking like, hmm, this is interesting. And like probably within maybe 10 minutes of playing music on loudspeakers, there was a 1,000 people standing there. And I looked at that crowd, and I, I got up, and the Holy Spirit really spoke heavily to me, like never before, other than salvation and when God spoke to me about coming to this ministry. And it was from Luke chapter 4, verse 16 to 21, the first message that Jesus will preach when he comes to it. And by the way, he did it in his hometown. And I love how it says they handed him the book. Well, there weren't any iPads in those days, so... He couldn't be handed one of those things or an iPhone or something like that. But it keeps talking about the book, handed in the book. And it says he turns to the place in uh, Isaiah where it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for he has anointed me to what? Preach the gospel. He, he's, he was anointed to preach the gospel. That's really incredible. Anointed, set apart, given power to preach the good news. And the good news is really interesting. The, the word uh, means in particular the person of God, the work of God, and the purpose of God. Say it again. The, the word gospel means the person of Christ, the work of the cross, and the eternal purpose of God. And boy, don't I need to hear the good news continually when it's about the person of God, the work of God, and the purpose of God. I need to hear that every single day because there's... In the atmosphere, there is so much bad news. Some bad news in me. It's called the old sin nature. And there's some bad news in you too. But the good news. So Jesus gets up to preach and he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. I thought, this is amazing. The poor get the riches of grace. Then he says, to heal the brokenhearted. Brokenhearted people get abundant mercy from God. Then he says, the, the next point that he makes in that particular verse, he's talking about that people that were captives would be set free by a word of truth, I believe. Then it says the blind would, they, people that had blind eyes, they would get faith so they could see, and then the bruised would get a finished work position because bruised means people that have been just down in outers, and they just can't make it. What a message. He preached this message, you know, but something happened, and when he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears, they got a little bit upset. In the beginning, they said gracious words, wow. But when he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. They knew what he was saying. That you are looking at the God, Messiah, God, man. And the uh, message, gospel message, throw him off a cliff. <laughs> it's really interesting, isn't it? Preach a gospel message, throw him off a cliff. Wow. So we see that the gospel is hid to them that are what? Lost. It's hid. Satan wants to hide the good news. And he hides the good news by having so many different counterfeit gospels. We heard some of them mentioned today. JWs, Mormons, whatever. I mean, uh, orthodoxy without Christ. Uh, fundamentalists that are legalistic. Holiness people. Uh, emotionalism. If you don't have this gift, you're not born again. I mean, on and on it goes. And sad to say, people hear so much and they get really confused. And not only are they confused, but they're not even available to receive the truth of the gospel when it comes because Satan has blinded their what? Their minds. He's blinded their minds. 
Yet we have the great opportunity to bring the light of what? To this lost and dying world. The light of the glorious gospel. We bring a message to people. And we bring that message, and sometimes they don't want to hear it from our lips, but they have to read our lives. Are you with me? You work with somebody, and they, uh, I don't want, I, you don't even, I can't tell you how many times I heard that. Don't talk about Jesus. And I, I worked in prisons for 10 years. Don't talk about Jesus. I'm going to talk about Jesus. So the best thing to do is fire me. Sad to say, uh, somebody in my family had given all the money for those prisons. So I didn't have to worry about being fired. That's just the way it was. So I would preach, the, we'd preach the gospel and you'd see people. I mean, change. And I love it because we said this at the wrap yesterday. We, the gospel says you can come just as you are. You, and that doesn't mean just when you get saved, but even in my life, every moment of every day, I can come, rather than becoming introspective and analytical about what's happening in my life, why this problem is there, I wonder what's going on, is this ever going to change, how long would this besetting sin, get this thorn out of my flesh, and on and on it goes, I just come the way I am. I just come the way I am. And God makes the changes. Amen? God does the changing. That's why when he was talking about, I, by the way, I've heard that gospel that he was talking about this morning about repent, repent, repent. A guy in a white robe standing on street corners or all over Africa screaming at people, repent, and there's not one person listening. People just walk right by. Could care less about that message. Screaming repentance and holiness. Well, you know what? God gave you the Holy Spirit so he could be holy. Duh. You know, come on. And it's, it's incredible. And so when that, if, this is, if the glorious gospel is not understood, then all of a sudden I'm going to try to be a better person. Have you ever tried to be a better person? Tried to be more patient? Huh? Tried to do what your wife would like you to do in the house? That never works for me. I, I can't try. It's either grace or, or forget it. It's either grace or forget it. The grace of God. But I come just as I am. And I am openly received by God. And that is so awesome. There was this girl one time. And uh, I was evangelizing. And I said to her, can I talk to you about Jesus? She said, shut up. I said, that's impossible. <laughs> she said, I don't want to hear about Jesus. I'm a Buddhist. I said, oh, you're a Buddhist, huh? Do Buddhists? Uh... She was getting high. You know? I said, you... you... <laughs> You're a Buddhist, huh? I said, Jesus Christ can deliver you. He loves you. He cares about you. Shut up, I said. And she started yelling at me, getting angry. I said, tomorrow morning, I'm coming at 9 o'clock to pick you up. You're going to church. She goes, are you a psychopath? She goes, I told you, shut up. I hate Jesus. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not coming to church. That's crazy. 9 o'clock in the morning, I went down. I said, I'm here. She goes, didn't you get what I said yesterday? She goes, I have got so many issues in my life. There are so many things. I'm living with somebody. This is going on in my life. That's going on in my life. This happened. That happened. And, and even this whole thing I told you about being a Buddhist and religion, that's not even true. I just could care less about whatever you call God. I said, let's go. Get in the car. She came. She got saved. She moved into our house. She went to Bible school and graduated for four years. You know what? I just said to her, come just as you are. You come just as you are. Do I have to give up this? No, Christianity is not do this and don't do that. I actually can walk around. I can't believe it. You know, it's not easy standing behind there for a long time. Just, you, know, you can come just as you are. You come crippled. You come with you know, one eye, one eye. Just as you are. Isn't that awesome? I can come just as I am. That's amazing. Just as I am. And that's the, that's the message. And that means even after saved, I'm saved, I'm born again, we find that all kinds of things go on in our lives and we begin to think about the purpose of God and say, that can't be me. You don't 
I, by the way, God knows you better than you know yourself. Isn't that awesome? Think you know yourself? We, we seem to think that we know ourselves better than God knows us. And God is saying, come, just as you are. And I was reading in Exodus chapter 3 today, when Moses, I mean, he doesn't just commit murder. He digs a hole and buries a guy. I mean, you know, come on. Huh? Huh, I'm going to kill him, make sure nobody knows. God calls him. Hmm? Who's that? At the burning bush. It's I am. And I was thinking about this. The name I am means the eternal one, the personal one, the omnipotent one, the omniscient one, the omnipresent one. That's what haya in the Hebrew and ego imai in the Greek means. He's eternal. <laughs> he's personal. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipotent and he's omnipresent. Wow. So because the I am is who he is, I can come just as I am. Amen. Moses, I'm really not even looking at what's taking place. I'm going to use you to deliver the children of Israel. Don't you understand? I need deliverance. I'm going to use you to deliver them. He has committed murder and God is calling him to be a deliverer. Sometimes we look at ourselves and we say, I don't know, like, well, how could I be used in the gospel, in the community, ministering to people? We take a look at ourselves and God says, believe me. By the way, three murderers wrote 60% of the Bible. Paul, David, and Moses. How's that feel? Hmm? Just as I what? Just as I am. Stop smoking. Now, I, I think smoking is not good for you. It'll kill you. Your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. No, but the Bible doesn't say stop smoking, then come. The Bible doesn't say stop having bad thoughts and come. The Bible doesn't say, you know, change this and change that through your own efforts. Your 10, 12-step program. And when you've gotten through all of that, then you can what? Come. No. You come just as you are. Woman at the well... Here's what's going to happen before I can talk to you. You're going to have to repent of your sins. You're going to have to do some good works. You're going to have to feed these hungry disciples. You're going to have to say, I'm not going to be a Samaritan anymore. I'm going to make sure that I change uh, my ways and I'm going to become more Jewish. Jesus didn't say that at all. He just said to her, I am He. I'm Messiah. I've come to give you, uh, give you living water. You want to give me a drink? I'm going to give you living water. He took her. Where was she? Where was she at in her marriage, marriages relationship? On the fifth or so, right? Just as I what? Just as I am. Just as I am. And that God says about every single one of us. It's, a, it's amazing. You come just as you are. And that's how I'm going to grow as a believer. And certainly, I understand that I fail. Isn't it great that God loves people and hates sin? Hello? Just read uh, Matthew chapter 9, 10 through 13. They said, this man, he's eating and drinking with publicans and notoriously habitual continual sinners. And Jesus said, uh, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Imagine that. I mean, imagine those religious people standing around with their religious outfits on. Look at him. He's eating with publicans, tax collectors, the people that take our money, and sinners. He said, I didn't come to call the righteous. By the way, the healthy don't need a physician. The sick do. They can come just as they are. You knew you could approach Christ. Isn't that awesome? I can make an approach. It's not based upon my condition. And by the way, don't use this as an opportunity to live outside of God's will or to say I can live like hell and sin as much as I want and then I know I can come because that means you really do not understand God and maybe who knows where you're really at. But I can come just as I am. I'm weak, I come. Mephibosheth, you're going to eat at my table for the rest of your life. Isn't that awesome? Huh? David! Oh, I know you killed Uriah the Hittite, took his wife. You know what? You're still the king. Amen? Saul, Saul, 
Why are you persecuting me? I'm going to show you what you're going to be used for in your life. I'm going to make you a preacher. Can you imagine Paul preaching this gospel? He's killed Christians and in prison. By the way, God gave the apostle Paul two major messages. One was grace. He was Mr. Law. He was blameless according to the law. The other was the message on the body, and he persecuted the what? How's that one, huh? He gives him the revelation of grace in the body. It's phenomenal. And you can come just as you are on the road to Damascus. The first thing he said, here's, here's Mr. Religion. What will you have me to do? Isn't that interesting, the first statement he makes? That just shows you where we can be at in our lives. And God says, just come just as you are. That's what Hosea was all about. That's how God looked at Israel. My people that were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness when I went to cause them to rest. Yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love and with loving kindness I will draw you. I will build you again. Watch this, O virgin Israel. He's saying that to Israel when they have gone astray. For years, idolatry he calls them a virgin. Everlasting love. I'm taking you just as you are. Certainly we understand that God disciplines and it's in love. But that's why the prodigal a son could come back and the father would say, this my son was lost, but he's found he's my son. Isn't that awesome? Just as he is. Whatever he had gone through, whatever was taking place in his life. A young, not a young man, but a middle-aged man. Uh, my brother was counseling him and he, he was probably the best uh, categorical thief I ever met in my life. If you ask me what's a categorical thief, it's a thief that really knows what he's doing. I mean, he was the best in Massachusetts. There was nobody better. He could walk into a store and walk out with 24 suits on a rack and you thought he worked for the company. <laughs> he got into a heroin problem. My brother counseled him. He got saved, but he had a 10-year sentence and he went to prison. And the Holy Spirit said to me, go to this prison, Concord Prison in Massachusetts, uh, Gardner Penitentiary in Concord he was at, and go there every week. You know what happened? He, he had, I, I got to stop this, stop doing this, stop the drugs, stop the alcohol, stop chasing women, stop the, he, had, he had his nine or ten stop counts. I said to him, won't mention the name, just come as you are. God loves you. He has mercy for you. Just come as you are. You know what? Today he has three children serving God. He ran a home for us for people that had drug and alcohol problems. Why? Because we've heard for years the message of the glorious gospel. Dr. Stevens preached the glorious gospel. Pastor Chowder preaches the glorious gospel. People around the world in this ministry preach this glorious gospel, and it just says, come. That's why if people are excited about coming to church. That's why Rodney's excited. His excitement, I feel like so one of these times he's going to knock me over. He's so excited, and, and I'm going to be lying on flat on my back with his foot on me because he's so excited about the gospel. Awesome, bringing people all the time. It's amazing. Just as I am. Onesimus, you can come just as you are. Woman in Luke 7, you just come just as you are. There's no, there's, listen, God's not going to make you feel guilty. He's not going to condemn you. As we heard this morning, God is what? For us? I love that idea about the chain. The Romans 8, 28, 29, and 30 chain. Those, I called it, I was thinking about saying the grace chain. Okay, predestinated by the grace mind. Foreknown by the grace mind. Predestinated by grace. Then, what was the next one? Called by grace. Justified by the finished work in grace. And glorified by the grace of God. And you can't break the chain. You can't put anything in there to break it. And then he says, what shall we say to these things? I love that. You know, I like Isaiah 49, 14 through 16. It says, Zion said, the Lord has forsaken us. The Lord has forgotten us. God said, can a mother forsake her sucking child? I have written you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. I don't care what you say. This is what God says. A lot of people are saying a lot of things and proclaiming it is God saying it. And they could even use the Bible, but not use it correctly. 
But we know what God says. And this is glorious gospel. So It's so clear to me and it was so clear to us and it's so clear to uh, the writers of the Bible that Paul would say this. I marvel that you are so soon removed. What happened to you Galatians? You were given the gospel of grace in Acts 14.3. He was long time preaching the gospel of grace. You are so soon removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel. And there's people that trouble you and would pervert the message. Then he says this, which is amazing. We can say this to ourselves. Though we, or a messenger from heaven, preach any other gospel other than what you have received, let him be anathema. Well, that's pretty strong, isn't it? It doesn't mean you're going to hell. It means everything you do is devoted to destruction. If it's not the glorious gospel, everything that's done has nothing to do with edification, has nothing to do with uh, life. It's all destruction. And he said it twice. He said, listen, I'm, a, I'm, I'm shocked. What happened to the church? And that's why I think when we go around the world and we're preaching in places, we constantly want to remind people and reiterate time and time again, it's, it's this glorious gospel. It's this amazing grace gospel. And we come just as we are. Blind Bartimaeus, rich Zacchaeus, leper 17, Luke 17, leper. Can you imagine putting your hand in the hand of a leper? That's what Jesus did. Your hand in the hand of a leper. Come just as you are. And this is incredible. This is, this is why we're excited about the ministry. We're excited about the gospel. It's exciting to bring this to Baltimore. Incredible. We had, we had some visitors from the market this morning, and, and there was one man that came. I think I've invited him at least 120 times. And on and on and on. And he, I came in this morning and said, I'm here! I mean, I was actually in shock. He stayed for both services, too. He said, this, and he said to me, this is my church. He said, this is my church, you know. I mean, this went on for four years, every week for four years. Had to be over 120 times, constantly inviting him, you know. On and on it goes, and then he finally came. And I said, you just come just as you are. I, I don't have this. I don't have that. I don't have a place to live. I got this problem, that problem, this situation, that situation. None of that matters. You just come the way you are just as I am, because he's the great I am. And we can come. You look, through the, you look through the Gospels and you see it time and time again, as he said this morning in the Gospel of John, you don't see the word repent. And I love it. Repentance, that word metanoia means change your thinking. How can I change my thinking unless I receive another thought pattern? Are you with me? What, what does the Gospel do? When the Gospel is preached, I receive a new way of what? thinking. God loves me. God cares about me. God wants to save me. God wants to come into my life. Wow. Then I believe that. It's not me doing this, 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 and this and saying, how do I look now, God? You notice all I've done? You must be pleased with me, right? No. Not one bit. This is my beloved son in what? in whom I'm well pleased. Here's the glorious gospel. And by the way, the glorious gospel was in the uh, Old Testament and the New Testament. I am the Lord thy God, I change not. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. James 1, 17 and 18. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above from the Father of all lights, in whom there is no variableness, nor shadow of turning. He doesn't change. He didn't say, okay, we're going to make a change. We're changing testaments, so we're going to change character. No, no, God has always been the God of all grace. It's always been a glorious gospel. It says Abraham in Romans 4 preached the gospel, the good news about who God is. It's always been the glorious gospel. And it's amazing. We, we, we have opportunities and people just do not know it. I was talking to somebody, I mentioned this in class. I was talking to somebody in therapy and they said, uh, I, I think I said it this morning, they said, I'm a, I'm a Muslim. I converted. I said, you didn't convert from anything. I said, you weren't saved, were you, in the church you were going to? He goes, no. I said, so there's no conversion. I said, nothing happened. 
I said you were, you were as lost then as you are now. now you got to be careful because he's the guy that's working your bones. Well, I wasn't careful because I don't know what that means. And he said, you're interesting to listen to. He says, well, you know what? I got this new way of thinking in Africa. I said, oh, really? He said, do you know anything about Africa? I said, a little bit. A little bit. I said, where did it happen? He said, in a certain place. I, I was there. I know what that place you're talking about. I said, I've been there about 25 years. He goes, what? Really? I said, you need to, get, you need to receive Christ. I said, you need Christ. God loves you. God cares about you, you know? I was wondering why a couple of the people at the therapy place were asking me, like, is my time over yet? Some want me to keep coming. Others are like, when are you done? When are you done? I said, oh, when God says I'm done. I don't know, whatever, you know? But we come just as we are. How many of us came that way, right? We came just as we are. And when we face obstacles and situations in our lives spiritually, do we realize we can just keep coming? Okay? Having a hard time in life? Keep coming. Things aren't working out so well in your marriage? Keep coming. Kids are, having, are, are living like crazy people? Keep coming. Right? I come just as I am. I don't listen to the accusations. Not a good father, not a good mother, not a good worker. That woman that called up Grace Hour, she goes, I'm just a little person. I don't really mean much. Her, what was her name? It was band with Jerry. Jerry. She's, she's going on. I, I just I interrupted her very strongly. Nah, that's enough of that. I am what I am by the grace of God. Don't ever say I'm just nobody. It's, it's just, well, it's the pastors and these other believers are incredible and all that. I'm just this little person that comes and sits in the seat. That is slandering the work of God. You realize who you are in Christ? Amen. That you're no different than anybody else, whether we're up, we're, we're here because of Christ. You're there because of Christ, right? We do what we do by the grace of God. That's who I am, by the grace of God. Dorcas... Tabitha, in, in the book of Acts, she was the only woman, there were disciples in the Bible, but she was the only one called a disciple. You know what she did? Peter raised her from the dead. They were walking around at her, uh, at her service, for her celebration service or whatever, and they were holding up all the things that she sewed for the body. She was called a disciple. She was a seamstress. She took what God gave her, the gift God gave her, and she spent it on the body. So I'm coming just as I am. She's, she's not Paul. She's not Peter. She's not a pastor. She's whatever. That, really get that out of your mind and realize simply that who I am is precious in the sight of God. And those who compare themselves among themselves are not wise. I don't compare myself with anybody else. I said to Pastor Stevens when I was talking to him one day, and I said, I could never do what you do. He goes, and I could never do what you do. I was like, huh? What do, you, what do you mean? Because I could never do it. I could never do that, what you're, what you're doing in Africa. I could never do that. And we realize, I come just as I am. I come just as I am. I don't think I amount to much. Come just as you are and realize how much you amount to God. How much He loves you. How much He cares for you. We come just as we are. There was a man one time, and uh, every time we would give him the gospel, and... Um, your uncle was really involved with this person, uh, Pastor Cabral, and he, it was amazing. And uh, I said to him, Jesus Christ loves you. <laughs> His was a unique approach. He spit at me. I said, oh, thanks. For, I needed some water to wash up anyway. <laughs> and, um, and you have to realize, I could be very volatile in the flesh. I, w I wanted to hang him like in my flesh, but then the Holy Spirit says, uh, no, that's not good. Then this went, this went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. I would evangelize him. He was a, he was a heroin addict and an alcoholic. Com what a combination. He was a mess. And he would be always in the south end of Springfield, and he would be always on our, an area. We decided to take an area of the city and spend 10 years in this area. I said, we're going to be down here so many hours a week for 10 years, and I'm not coming out. That was just the way, uh, I think that's, that's a great way to do it sometimes, if God leads you, of course. One day I didn't see him in his usual spot. He was always in his one spot all the time. And they said, he's really violently ill. So I went and I found out where he lived. He lived in it. This room was horrifying. There was 
Beer bottles everywhere, syringes. It was a mess. And I took somebody with me, Jim Henry it was. I took him with me. And I went up there and I said, you know, can we pray for you? Can we help you? Can we get you to the doctor? He goes, I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk about God. Look at me. He says, why did God let this happen to me? And I realized, you know, here, I don't know what he's been involved with before. So we went away, came back with some food and things like that. One day, Jim Henry, Pastor Jim Henry brought him to church. He got saved. He went three years to Bible school, and he was with me five years in Ghana as a missionary. Come just as you are. Come just as you are. And that doesn't mean, like, you know, for the lost only, but I, maybe, maybe I, I, I'm an introspective person. I analyze myself. I'm always looking at my life and being all kinds of critical. Come just as you are. I can grow. You know, I hear people say, I can't learn the Bible. Ha! What do you mean? He called ignorant and unlearned men in Acts 4, 11 through 13. They, had, they, were, they, they couldn't do anything. I don't even know if they could even read and write, maybe a little bit for sure. Come just as you are. We have blind people that come to Bible college in Africa. They get four-year degrees. Deaf people come just as you are, right? Come just as you are. What's happened in my life? The past is, aren't you glad the past is gone? Forgetting those things that are behind. Do you know how to forget? Remember what God has done and forget the rest. It's just not even worth thinking about. Forgetting those things that are behind. And that's amazing. I'm coming just as I am. Coming just as I am. And when people, you know, when people understand that gospel message, they are so comfortable with talking to us, with being around us. They realize you're not going to lay a religious trip on them. Do this. Don't do that. Have you been baptized? I had a guy who was yelling at me one time. You got to tell these people, not just give them the gospel. You got to baptize them. You got to get them baptized. He was yelling. There was like eight people there I was talking to. So I had a great, brilliant idea. I took a bottle of water and I baptized him. I said, you mean like that? Well, he went away really quick. Now you say, I'm not so sure I like that tactic. Well, uh, it worked. I got rid of him. Because he was telling people they've got to do something. And he was making people feel really as, as if they didn't count for God because they hadn't done that yet. You know what? That, leave that to God, right? You just leave those things to God and the person, their personal decision when they want to do that. Come just as you are. I'm weak. Come just as you are. I got problems. Come just as you are. Now, I've had a, a lot of sorrow in my life. Come just as you are. Sin is in my life. Come just as you are. Come just as you are. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You just come. That's all we have to do is come. We come because he came. He sent his only begotten son. That's amazing. So whether we're, they're people in India or they're in Nepal or they're in South America or they're in Central America, wherever they may be, it doesn't make any difference. You know, sometimes I, I hear people talk about, well, you don't know what my mission field is like. Is there people? It's the same. God, there's a devil, there's God, there's people, there's a message, there's the cross, there's the church, there's the gospel. It's no different. It's the same everywhere. And people can come. I'm so, I'm so, like, thrilled that we are in a ministry that preaches the glorious gospel. I mean, I've, I've been around situations where it doesn't go on, it doesn't happen. Wow. It's excruciatingly painful. But we have this glorious gospel message. It sets people free. People are free. It's, a, it's amazing. We can give it to anybody. We can give it to, I gave it one time to Jesse Jackson and Michael Dukakis when they were running for president. I said, can I talk to the both of you? It was in a rally, in a parade. I said, are you born again? Michael Dukakis looked at me and said, tell me what, what, what you're talking about. The other person said, beat it. So I went and met Michael Dukakis at the State House and gave him a Greek Bible and talked to him about salvation. See, we're not intimidated by what, by what people think they are or who people think they are. We just have a glorious gospel. It can save a president, a king. It can save an executive. It can save a businessman. It can save a drug addict, uh, an alcoholic. It can save a person that has uh, difficulties in any area in their marriage. It can save an adulterer, a fornicator. It can save a thief, a criminal. It can save a murderer. It's the glorious gospel. 
It's so awesome. It's so awesome. It can save a good person that thinks they're a good person, you know. They don't do any of that stuff. I'm good. Huh? There's none good. There's none good. It's a glorious gospel. I'm so thankful that I, I'm involved with uh, a ministry and people in the body where that message is being preached. There's nothing. I wouldn't trade what I do for anything. For anything. I wouldn't trade it for anything. There's no other life I would have want to live or want to live other than proclaiming the glorious gospel. I, I thought even if you're, you get old and you're in a wheelchair and you can't say much, you could just sit there and say, Jesus loves you. I got three words for you. That's enough. <laughs> Nothing else has to happen. God loves you. You can be transformed. We've got a glorious gospel. Amen. Don't let the enemy ever tell you any different. Having this glorious gospel, when Judson, the, the, the man who went to Burma, he had lost one wife, a second wife, and three children. And the British government said this to him. I wish I could find the quote. It's in his book, To the Golden Shores. They said, we want, we, you're the only one that knows the language in the country. We want you to take an ambassador's position in the capital of Rangoon, and we're going to pay you, which was equivalent to like $200,000 now. He said, for me to take that job and give up the glorious gospel, he said, would be something that would bring such sorrow in my life. God has called me to bring the glorious gospel. He's called me to bring the glorious gospel. And that's what we're all about. We're all in this together. And some, some may go to this country, to that country, this place, but this body, we're all about bringing this message of the glorious gospel to a lost and a dying world. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you tonight for this glorious gospel. What a, what a message you've given us. It's good news. The person of Christ, the, the work of Christ, the purpose of Christ, the glorious gospel. Thank you. What a message. We were without strength, ungodly, unrighteous, no good, sinners and enemies, and you loved us. Wow. That's incredible. Rahab, the harlot. Ruth, the Moabitess. Mark chapter 5, a man with 6,000 demons, a woman with an issue of blood. The glorious gospel. The poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind in Luke 14. It's the glorious gospel. It's amazing. Thank you. The centurion, the glorious gospel. The Syrophoenician woman, the glorious gospel. Lame man at the gate beautiful, the glorious gospel. The people of Samaria, the glorious gospel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God. What a privilege we have. There's somebody that's trying to blind our minds. Uh, what you're doing doesn't matter. He's a liar and the father of all lies. Trying to blind our minds. Blind our minds. We have the message of the glorious gospel. There's nothing more important on planet Earth. Nothing more. Going to the moon, going to Mars, going into the ocean, the depths of the sea, finding oil, having a good economy. None of it compares with the glorious gospel. The glorious gospel. That we have been called to proclaim it. We're nothing special. We're just sinners saved by grace. We've been saved by the glorious gospel. If you are here tonight or you're watching on the internet, you've never received Christ as your Savior. You can receive the glorious gospel. Say, Jesus, save me tonight. I believe that you are God the Son and you shed your blood on a cross for me. I receive it. Thank you for this message of the gospel that you've given to me personally tonight. With our eyes closed, our heads bowed, just put your hand up. If you're on the internet, just say yes to God. Jesus, save me tonight. This, this message of the glorious gospel. And for all of us that are sitting here, that we would be a people who realize with our eyes wide open the privilege, the calling, the purpose that we have in this world. We are to bring the light of the glorious gospel to a dark world. There's nothing, there's no other reason I'm here on this planet, but to receive from God and give to others. 
whether in the body or the gospel to the lost. That's the eternal purpose of God. That's what it means to glorify God. It's to build the body, edify the body, fellowship in the body, and win the lost. It's pretty simple. God's purpose, the body growing, the church, and the lost, the gospel. That's what glorifies Jesus Christ. We thank you. Bless our night tonight. Keep us safe on the roads. And we are so privileged to have the riches of his grace. In Jesus' name, amen.